good morning good afternoon and good evening to all our speakers chairs and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world welcome back to yet another episode of acns webinars the speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from japan professor jun sunega dr sunega is an assistant professor in the department of neurosurgery at the yokohama city university yokohama japan his research interests are focused on the surgery of skull base orbital tumors by craniofacial resection and cerebrovascular surgeries He is a member of several important neurosurgical organizations in Japan. He is also a noted author who has several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today he will be talking about orbital tumor surgery using exoscope. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Chen Hua. Professor Chen is a consultant in neurosurgery at the Jiangsu Province Hospital. His clinical interests are focused on endovascular as well as microsurgical treatment of cerebrovascular disease. He proposed the lantern technique for the treatment of complex aneurysms, which was recorded in the history of neurointervention development in China. He carried out the transvenous curative embolizations of cerebral AVMs earlier in China and completed the first staged transvenous embolization in Jiangsu and innovated a number of technologies to solve the obstacles of TVE. He won the World Neurosurgeon Award in the 15th WFNS World Congress of Neurosurgery in Seoul. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about transvenous embolizations of AVMs. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Hong Kong, Professor Calvin Mack. Dr. Mack is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Hong Kong. He is honorary clinical associate professor at the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is also an honorary secretary of the Hong Kong Neurosurgical Society. He has had an extremely meritorious career and has won many awards and accolades for that. He has published several articles in various peer journals and is also an invited faculty to various conferences and workshops conducted all around the world. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Dr. Jun Sunega. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President for the Yokogato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Dr. Galvin Mai. Well, thank you, Raja. Um, thank you for the um, kind invitation to chair the section. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, Professor Liu, and Professor Sunaka, and um, Professor Chen as well. So, um, <clears throat> so um, without further ado, uh, let's um, uh, proceed to the first section uh, that um, our honored speaker uh, from Japan, um, Yokohama, Professor Sunaka. Uh, the topic will be orbital tumors um, a removal by an interesting technique uh, using exoscope. So um, um, it would be um, uh, our pleasure and uh, for all the audience to learn uh, how uh, Professor Sunaga uh, would uh, proceed with uh, using exoscope um, to um, remove the uh, orbital tumor. Professor, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Mark, uh, for the kind uh, uh, introduction to me. So let me uh, start. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jun Senaga uh, from Yokohama City University. I appreciate you giving me such a great opportunity to make presentation to Professor Chairman, uh, Professor Raja, and uh, Miss, Mrs. Yoko Kato, uh, Professor of Fujita Medical University. Uh, my topic is orbital tumor surgery using exoscope. Uh, orbital tumor is relatively rare, and some ophthalmologists uh, do the surgery. I have some experience with this field in Japan. Uh, so today, I want to tell the tips and experience of exoscope recently. So let's start. I don't have any disclosure about this presentation. Uh, this is today's lineup. Uh, first, I'd like to show the orbital tumor uh, introduction. Next, about exoscope, what is risk and what is benefit. Uh, third, uh, about orbital anatomy and the surgery. Uh, last, uh, take home messages. I hope uh, you will enjoy my 40 minutes presentation. Uh, this is a paper from Professor Kong, uh, published in 2021, the trans-orbital uh, approach to the uh, sphenoorbital meningiomas. 
uh, this is a great uh, impact uh, to the this large tumor uh, is uh, resected from this superior eyelid surgery. The wound is very beautiful, and I, but I don't have any experience about this. So my topic is not this, just uh, uh, orbital tumor, not transorbital uh, approach. So uh, I'd like to uh, start my presentation, orbital tumor introduction. Uh, this is lateral approach. I sometimes use this three centimeter uh, eyelid incision and using this lateral approach, so-called crane line method. Uh, like this angioma is very suitable for these approaches. Uh, from 28 to 2022 in Yokohama City University, there are 111 orbital tumor cases. Uh, personally, I experienced over 80 uh, orbital surgery. Uh, most frequent one is uh, angioma, followed by pleomorphic adenoma, schwannoma, uh, solitary fibrous tumor, uh, lymphoma, inflammatory pseudotumor, optic nerve schist meningioma, pleomorphic adenoma or uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, orbital abscess, adenocystic carcinoma. Uh, this red one is a malignant uh, neoplasm uh, arising in the orbital region. And uh, then the rare one is like this left column, uh, like neurofibroma related to NF1, vascular malformation, uh, IgG4 related tumor, sphenoorbital meningioma, and dermolysis. And uh, the very rare one is the ABM, granular cell tumor, osteoma, latokase cleft cyst, xant granuloma, metastasis from breast cancer, sinus cyst, and optic glioma, and epidermoid. So there are so many kinds of region uh, can be arise in orbital area. According to the AJCC uh, classification of the cancer, uh, in the orbital and the adenexia, uh, this is a classification like a lacrimal gland tumor, a lymphoma, or other type of tumor. First, I'd like to show the orbital angioma uh, images. Uh, the feature is uh, MRI T2 images is very high intensity and well demarcated tumor. Uh, and uh, enhanced images, the mixed enhanced images. So, some are, something uh, occurred in the extracornal region, but mainly in the intracornal region. In this area, endoscopic transnasal resection is suitable, especially in the inferior medial to the optic nerve. Some thing is uh, some type. Some cases are multiple region, like both side or multiple area. Uh, before surgery, some cases like this huge case or intracornal apex area, the patient uh, complains a very severe visual function, like light perception perception level. Uh, this is. Three case, these three cases is the intraconus apex area below the optic nerve. I use the transmandibular, transantral approach for these cases, but uh, visual function was very severe after surgery. So I think this is a very uh, dangerous area. Uh, on the other hand, this is the optic nerve schist meningioma. Uh, compared to the angioma cases, uh, the enhanced pattern is very uh, different. It is homogeneously enhanced, and the optic nerve uh, is run through in the tumor. Uh, this is this six, eight year old man is very huge cases, uh, like uh, intra orbital to the intracranial extension. So the, his left visual function is already lost. And there are two spinal orbital meningioma cases like this. 
but I don't use uh, transorbital approach, just transcranial approaches. Uh, I'd like to show the angioma cases. This is relatively uh, bigger cases, like over three centimeter, but uh, intraorbital pressure is very high. So the important thing is uh, to open the periorbital as possible as we can. It's naturally come, uh, the tumor comes and the surface on the uh, angioma, there is a thin membrane. So it pe peel off the membrane, uh, it's easily uh, dissected. This yellow one is an optic nerve. It is compressed uh, medially. So in this case, I use uh, transcranial approach to the lateral approach. The, all the tumor is removed. This is a summary of the angioma cases. Uh, the most frequent uh, used approach was uh, transcranial approaches. And uh, sometimes I use transantral and endoscopic approach, especially that the tumor is inferomedial to the optic nerve, the endoscopic or transantral uh, through the maxillary sinus is very good one. And sometimes I use orbitozygomatic approach because uh, lateral muscle inferiorly the direction is, if the, uh, suitable, I use the orbitozygomatic approach and the lateral approach. The rejection rate is a gross total removal is all but one. One case is very severely attached to the uh, optic nerve. The symptoms are the, um, Unfortunately, the two cases, visual, visual function was worsened after the surgery because uh, these two cases located in the apex inferior to the optic nerve. So the, this area is very dangerous uh, to preserve the optic function. Okay, then uh, next to the, about the exoscope, uh, about risk and benefit. Uh, what is exoscope? Uh, of course, I I think you uh, guys are well known about the exoscope. In my institute, uh, the Olympus company uh, named OBI is uh, used from this April. The there is a huge, uh, large monitor, 4K, 3D images, so the surgeon can do surgery in front of like the movie theater. Uh, the feature is a uh, head up surgery, not watching scope, but watching wide monitor. So the surgeon can do surgery by easy posture. So it contributes to reduce the fatigue, not look down the uh, over, uh, over scope. Uh, the technology make it possible to observe much wider direction compared to the conventional microscope uh, because surgeon doesn't have to uh, look into the scope. So the, even from the horizontal direction like this, uh, we can uh, observe the surgical field. Uh, this is a lineup from the exoscope uh, so the, this is uh, exoscope itself, OBI, and the company with the uh, foot switch and 3D glasses. Auto focus and fluorescence are also possible, and uh, both two monitor is uh, available. This is my uh, operative uh, room. Uh, this is monitoring system. Uh, this is some monitor and this is main monitor. This is over 100, it's easily uh, handed out. So this is uh, uh, easy find, uh, manipulated. This is nurse and this is size microscope. Uh, recently, I use only this uh, OBI systems. Actually, uh, this patient is a CP angle posterior fossa meningioma cases, but using this uh, exoscope, uh, the patient was positioned supine and 
head is rotated to the contralateral side. This is me, and the, during the surgery, uh, like this, this is over, and the, this, there is a two assistant, and there's a monitoring echo, and the observer also can wear, wear glasses. I'd like to show the orbital cases using exoscope. This is 67-year-old woman, recurrent of the left pleomorphic adenoma 16 years later. The tumor itself is very uh, small, uh, like uh, less than two centimeter, uh, but it uh, comes uh, uh, breaking the bone and come from this and removed all the tumor. And pathology was uh, malignant changed adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, this is a view of the OVI ex uh, exoscope images. Uh, compared to the conventional microscope, uh, I think the bright, brighter the microscope and the surgeon do the surgery just before the big monitor like endoscope. Uh, the feasibility, uh, operability is, uh, I think it's good. Uh, removed from the surrounding uh, adipose fat tissue, uh, I can reject all the tumor. But the pathology was malignant, so we need the post-operative uh, therapy. Uh, cutting the uh, surrounding and dissecting the surrounding tissue. So the, it's, actually we, uh, I recognize the 3D images wearing glasses. After resection, yeah, cutting and all the malignant tumor. This is a comparison to the exoscope, microscope and endoscope about the orbital surgery. Uh, operability, I think exoscope is the same uh, or dominant to microscope because microscope uh, direction is something restricted. So the narrow range compared to the exoscope. Endoscope, especially from using the nasal rostral, so the narrow manipulation field. Observation, uh, ex using exoscope brighter than microscope. And the microscope assistant is only 2D images. Uh, as for endoscope, uh, possible to come close. So the observation, the endoscope is, uh, I think, the best. But the exoscope is also good. Uh, about assistance, uh, I think as uh, using exoscope, uh, the assistants need some experience because the direction is the wrong direction, uh, di direction like area and hand. Uh, the microscope also need experience, but uh, get familiar. Endoscope assistance is, I think, hard. Suitable location. Endoscope is the inferomedial location is the best. Uh, microscope, superomedial to superlateral is the best, but the exoscope, uh, further a uh, wider range, like supermedial to the inferolateral. So the, I think this uh, recent, recently exoscope is very useful, even in the orbital surgery. Uh, tips is like a layout of the exoscope and the monitor. Uh, for assistant, the sub monitor is uh, uh, facing to assistant is, I think it's very important. And also, over eye comes to the left back uh, to the right-handed uh, surgeon. Next, uh, we I move on to the orbital anatomy and the other surgery. Uh, this is a uh, well-known uh, Roton orbital uh, textbook of the orbital anatomy. Uh, of course, you know well about the bony structure, uh, about superorbital fissure, inferorbital fissure, optic canal. Uh, there are so many uh, orbital landmarks in. Uh, 
to the inferiority, uh, there is a, a nervous lacrimal canal, and the sagittal plane is like this. Nervous systems, uh, orbit is, uh, there are so many fat tissue, and there are so uh, important nerves run through in it. So it's very dangerous to preserve function. Uh, especially in the, the annals of thin. Uh, nerves run outside the anal of thin, the frontal nerve, uh, first branch of the trigeminal nerve, trochlear nerve, post nerve, and the lacrimal nerve uh, run outside the annals of chin. Also, the inside the anal of chin, uh, the oculomotor nerves, and the abducens nerve and the nasociary nerve, uh, first branch of the trigeminal nerves. Arterial structure uh, of about as for the ophthalmic artery, uh, there are branches into the most important branch is the central retinal artery and the short and long ciliary artery. So the especially adjacent to the optic nerve, uh, never use the coagulation. Be careful not to damage the central retinal artery. Otherwise, we use the patient uh, visual uh, function. Uh, also, the optic ophthalmic artery uh, branch to the esmoidal branches or lacrimal uh, or recurrent branches. This is anatomy essential for the endonasal approaches. Sometimes this is maxillary sinuses and the median canal, median nerve, or uh, infraorbital nerves. Uh, we have we have to know about this anatomy. Uh, in YCU Yokohama City University, the the annually the cadaveric course were held. So in that case, in that situation. Uh, I can confirm the uh, novel uh, approaches. Uh, this is the teal method, fixation method. So compared to the uh, whole marine uh, fixation, it's uh, soft and the natural uh, texture of the tissues. This is optic nerve. And also after uh, anterior crinoidectomy, this is cadaveric body. Uh, I can confirm the annals of chin. This is of ochromotor nerves and the cut the ochromotor uh, annals of chin. Uh, be careful to the outside nerves. And then open the anal of chin and confirm the ochromotor nerve, abducens nerve, and the nasal ciliary nerve near to the uh, optic nerve. In the clinical situation, I think it's very uh, rare and dangerous, but sometimes it's essential. Okay, next uh, approach setting and surgical instruments. Uh, this is my mentor, uh, Professor Dr. Kawahara, former uh, Yokohama City University Department of Surgery professor. Unfortunately, he was died six years ago but he do a lot of uh, orbital surgery. About transcranial approaches, uh, I use uh, general anesthesia, TBER, because of the VEP monitoring. VEP is essential, especially in preserving the uh, optic function. Sometimes I use the spinal drainage uh, especially in the extra approach, it's very useful, uh, like uh, anterior crinoidectomy or optic canal decompression. But in anterior part, like lacrimal tumor, is not needed. Uh, 30 millimeter uh, CSF is evacuated before craniotomy. If the dura still swell, additional CSF is removed. When closing, uh, artificial uh, CSF art serve is replenished intradurally. But nowadays, the patient complained uh, sometimes severe headache after uh, pressing the spinal drainage. So recently, I don't use spinal drainage. 
Uh, this is a typical method of our my uh, opening of the skin incision and craniotomy. The two layer method of the temporal muscle dissection to preserve the tem temporal muscle fascia and the periosteum and the open the uh, craniotomy according to the tumor location. If the tumor is uh, right laterally, this area is uh, enough. And this, if the tumor is upper, the medial uh, craniotomy is essential. Using the uh, chisel, uh, the sphenoidal bone reach is removed and there we made a gutter to the orbital rim. Yeah. And then next to move on to the microscope or recently exoscope. Uh, first important thing is uh, to start with uh, uh, drilling, drilling of the orbital roof near the superorbital fissure. This area is very safe because uh, periorbital and the bone is not attached here. So every time I uh, started the drilling here, uh, the lateral part periorbital is strongly adhered to the bone. So sometimes it's a uh, part is coming. Nowadays we use uh, exoscope. So this is actually the microscope, but nowadays we I use the exoscope. So the uh, lower angle is easily uh, get. Uh, using T cell open the superior to the lateral orbital wall. And preserving the uh, bony wall, I think it's important to cosmetic uh, preservation. This is pleomorphic adenoma, 39-year-old man, the same uh, maneuver, uh, like drilling the superior, superlateral orbital wall. This is actually the lacrimal gland, uh, uh, skin color, uh, uh, is a uh, lacrimal gland. All the tumor is removed and the periorbital is uh, sutured. After surgery, all the tumor is removed. Pleomorphic adenoma is very suitable for the surgery. Uh, it's easy uh, to remove, but it's essential to remove all the tumor uh, and block. I'd like to uh, introduce my uh, uh, preferred apparatus, uh, like Ronju or microforceps or a Kelson, one millimeter Kelson. And this is uh, like uh, some variety of the sp uh, yeah, uh, spat spatula and uh, uh, yes. Other cases is uh, 41 year old uh, angioma cases, post trauma, uh, soccer ball hit five years ago, and then he uh, preoperatively, he almost lose left perception vision, like this central area. There's a huge uh, difficulty area in visual function. In this case, I use uh, trans. Uh, Orbital zygomatic approach because this, there is an optic nerve here. So that this direction is uh, very suitable. So post, post surgery, the, his visual function improved. Sorry. Uh, uh, this is the same method uh, using the. This is a uh, zygomectomy, like L-shaped incision using the chisel. The, this L-shaped uh, zygoma is removed and preserved. And the uh, temporal muscle is inferior laterally. The, uh, the, uh, yeah. And uh, they made a gutter to the orbital limb. This is a curved bar. I like this curved bar because it uh, doesn't obstruct the visual field. Anterior crinoidectomy, and then open 
the uh, superior lateral orbital wall, the, because there is a huge uh, angioma in it, so the intraorbital pressure is very high. So the peri cut the periorbital as possible as we can. There is an angioma here. Important thing is uh, not to use uh, uh, coagulator much. Uh, only the surface is, I think, is good. Dissect one direction. There is a uh, lateral muscle, so the this direction from the inferior lateral direction. Uh, there is a uh, optic nerve is run through here. And all the tumor, angioma is removed here, like this. And the suture using the 60 nylon. And as possible as we can, uh, I think this is enough to cosmetically. And using the titanium plate and using hydroxy apatite. This is post operative uh, patient uh, face. Uh, before surgery, the exophthalmos and visual function is almost uh, past light perception level, and the uh, eye movement is all recovered. And there's a wound. I think it's a uh, good one. This is also the huge, uh, big one, uh, exophthalmos dipropia. Uh, this is a uh, optic nerve, so the it's very important according to the optic nerve. So this is, uh, this cases I use this approach because we can, uh, if we choose this approaches, optic nerve is the uh, most, uh, uh, yeah, far from the approaches. So I utilize these approaches. And then visual function is uh, preserved and the dipropia improved. Uh, then I'd like to introduce my uh, anterior crinoidectomy intradurally, uh, optic nerve decompression. So first, uh, peel off the membrane, like uh, transcavernous approaches. Uh, this is meaning orbital band, cut many MOB and peel off. Uh, and this is anterior crinoid. Uh, as possible as we can, uh, like this field is uh, get. And using the four millimeter uh, extra coarse drilling, drill, uh, first open the superorbital fissure and roofing here. This is periorbital. So the periorbital and the optic nerve sheath is uh, uh, continuously, so I can uh, uh, safely drill the uh, bone, like this method, using this curved bar. This is this part of the optic, uh, proximal part of the optic nerve. Yeah, and this is the optic nerve and roofing. And finally, uh, the anterior crinoid is removed. This is my manner of the optic uh, drench approach. And this is also utilized to the other uh, intracranial uh, approaches because uh, first opening the uh, periorbiter and confirm the dura matter, I think it's very uh, easy and time shortening approaches. Uh, this longure is very uh, useful. Uh, this is a curve bar. Uh, the important and the benefit is uh, uh, like curve bar doesn't uh, disturb the surgeon's vision like this compared to the straight one. It's very uh, straight one. It's very uh, useful. And then this is uh, uh, optic nerve sheath meningioma cases. 39 year old woman uh, complained about uh, the light exophthalmos, visual 
impairment before surgery, central scotoma, uh, para and congestion of papi papilla, uh, but no double vision because of the lower visual function. There is a tumor uh, and the inside there is a uh, optic nerve runs through it, like bull's eye sign. Uh, during the surgery, BEP monitoring showed uh, transient uh, irregular uh, or diminished BEP monitoring, but after stopping the maneuver, recovered later. This is a surgery, same method. There is a uh, optic nerve is here. So first opening the anterior crinoidectomy. And because uh, it's very useful to confirm the uh, position of the optic nerve. Uh, this is curved bar, crinoidectomy, and the optic slug is removed here. This is optic nerve, so the intraorbital area it's very important to confirm where uh, optic nerve lands. Uh, this is uh, meningioma cases. The biopsy shows a uh, meningioma. So the, only the decompression is enough. All the removal is very dangerous. Using QSER, uh, remove the upper part of the tumor. Uh, otherwise, if we, uh, program, uh, do the extent surgery, I think we will lose uh, patient uh, visual function. So the optic nerve meningioma, I think the right, post-operative radiation is very uh, useful and important tactics. Uh, transient VP deterioration was observed among seven optic nerve sheath meningioma. Uh, two, 29%. But stop maneuver and recovered, uh, no permanent uh, VP loss and visual loss. So the differential diagnosis of optic nerve sheath meningioma, something uh, like uh, inflammatory pseudotumor, plasma cytoma and lymphoma, like this area, the optic nerve runs through in the tumor. So it's very, uh, confused about the optic nerve sheath meningioma and other uh, pseudotumor or lymphoma. But in these cases, uh, this 80-year-old uh, aged woman, uh, non-surgery cases, only steroid administration can uh, remove, uh, improve the symptom. So the, I think the diagnosis was uh, inflammatory pseudotumor. So post-operative irradiation, uh, the IMRT stereotactic radiation is very useful. Uh, this paper shows uh, 26, uh, among 26, nine uh, surprisingly improved, 12 stable and five decreased. Uh, among our uh, series, also the visual function is almost stable. Uh, this is a uh, uh, extent uh, cases uh, ineligible to treatment like uh, ductal carcinoma, lacrimal gland. So already uh, there are a lot of metastasis. So the biopsy only and herception was used in these cases. But uh, nine months later, pain control, but uh, overall survival was 11 months. Other extremely cases, the 68 sphenoid rich meningioma orbital extension. Uh, this patient, even though this uh, facial uh, symptoms, he doesn't come to the hospital because something I think he has mental retardation to, due to the, this meningioma extension like this. So the preoperatively left visual function was lost, almost lost. So Simpson grade one removal was performed uh, using uh, free abdominal flap uh, help with uh, plastic surgeon and the intracranial removal of the, of the meningioma like this. 
And this is the uh, abdominal flip flap. Before surgery, uh, we use uh, embolization of uh, middle meningeal artery, uh, accessory meningeal artery, uh, superficial temporal artery, and the inf uh, internal maxillary artery. Because this patient uh, is left blindness, yeah, like this, uh, it's easy to uh, embolize. This is surgery intracranial part or intraorbital part. All the uh, tumor was removed. This is there is an eyeball here, and uh, using uh, free flap reconstruction. Like this. Uh, this is also the aged patient as uh, a pathology was solitary fibrous tumor. SFT, solitary fibrous tumor, is something I think is uh, difficult because sometimes it uh, severely uh, attached to the uh, nerves important structure. Uh, this patient before the uh, surgery has test shows the left oculomotor palsy. So medial and the upper movement impaired. So he, she showed diplopia and these faces. So he, she complained to me, uh, her grandson called her as a ghost. So even though her age uh, status, she uh, want to me to remove the tumor. Uh, yeah, like left oxopsalmos and movement toward lateral downward is possible. This is solitary fibrous tumor, and less than six hours I can remove all the tumor. Half year after surgery, uh, her uh, symptoms was all improved and visual function no deterioration, like this. I was happy to uh, see like the happy patient. Uh, this is sphenoorbital meningioma cases. Uh, before surgery, I sometimes use uh, embolization of many middle meningeal artery, like 90% flow reduction was achieved. And uh, yeah, proptosis and dipropia was improved. Vascular anomaly is very uh, difficult. Uh, this is a 78-year-old man uh, with a high flow shunt. So the preoperative state is severe eye pain and diplopia and the reddish of the conjunctive. Uh, PT, uh, Pactanus uh, transarterial embolization was performed because this uh, vessels Every shunt has a high flow shunt. Uh, can you see this central retinal artery uh, from divided to the ophthalmic artery, the first segment? So the catheter was uh, inserted beyond the, this part. So the using NBCA, the region was embolized safely and improved exophthalmos and diplopia. And then still she he complains the pain. Uh, uh, I, use, I perform the evacuation and the remo uh, reduction surgery. The pathology was ABM. This is rare cases, uh, granular cell cytoma, uh, inferior to the optic nerve and uh, this uh, inferior medial part. So this case, I use the uh, trans maxillary trans approach, not using this uh, transnasal approach. I think transnasal approach is also good, but uh, yeah, I think this is very hard tumor and the wider uh, surgical field is essential. Nowadays, maybe I use the exoscope for this area. So the, all the tumor was removed and uh, the construction was used uh, uh, first year. Yes. 
uh, inferior medial orbital tumor is like uh, angioma or SFT or pseudo tumor or traumatic uh, anom venous anomaly. Uh, this 43 years old woman is uh, angioma apex. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, made worse the visual function after surgery to her. Uh, this is using endoscope observation and actually using this transantral approach uh, to remove the tumor. Uh, incision to the conjunct uh, gingiva and drilling the inferior uh, bone to the orbit. And the older tumor is removed, but during the surgery, the VEP was uh, ten, uh, diminished. Yeah, the tumor is all removed, but two cases, these two um, bad cases, uh, uh, I regret these cases, uh, VEP attenuation was observed during surgery. And severely, uh, these two cases, the visual function is diminished like this. So the uh, op uh, optal apex, especially in the inferior medial part of the optic nerve is very dangerous. I think because of the central retinal artery uh, run just below the optic nerve. Uh, last one, uh, the 75-year-old woman. Uh, this is, uh, here we can see the tumor. Left cavernous sinus to orbital apex. Uh, this is uh, over 20 millimeter tumor. And the ISO, ISO uh, intense uh, area was in it. But the visual function is uh, very severe, like this. In this case, uh, we, I use uh, endonasal approaches because uh, inferior, inferior medially to the cavernous sinus, uh, only the endonasal approaches I think is suitable. Uh, with the uh, ENT doctor, uh, this is optic canal and first I de uh, decompress the optic canal using drill and this is inferior part of the uh, orbit, orbital apex. Yeah, during the uh, optic canal and reduce the pressure. Fortunately, uh, the uh, cavernous sinus was already uh, uh, coagulated, so the, there's no severe hemorrhage. So the, this uh, soft uh, tumor, uh, pathology was schwannoma, was easily uh, removed, and the visual function was improved after surgery. The, Good uh, feature of the endoscope is uh, uh, we can cross to the uh, region and easy to um, observe. Like this, all tumor is removed. Uh, final take home messages. Uh, approach for the orbital tumor should be taken the adjacent angle or relation to optic nerve. Uh, preoperative image is a key for diagnosis, and inflammatory tumor is effective to steroid without morbidity. Optic canal decompression is useful to preserve visual function, and periorbital should be widely opened as much as possible. Exoscope for orbital surgery is useful and easy to manipulate. Orbital apex and the inferior to optic nerve area has a high risk of visual function. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Professor Sunika, for the wonderful presentation. And um, I'm impressed by your wide variety of your cases. There's now um, uh, discussion time. So I'll just read out the question from the audience first. And then um, um, uh, if time allows, then I may um, discuss um, some um, important um, surgical points uh, with you as well to learn from you. 
So um, there are two questions um, from the audience. Um, so the first question is in optic sheath um, meningioma with visual impairment, how many percentage improved and how many uh, patients with a deteriorated vision after operation? Thank you for your uh, question from the uh, web uh, website. Uh, the, I have only seven cases, and the visual imp uh, with visual all the cases is visual impairment. So the uh, only one case is after uh, radiation therapy. Uh, I experience the improvement of the visual function, and the rest of the six cases is uh, same to uh, stable to the visual. Uh, impairment. So the no cases, I don't experience uh, any worsen the uh, visual function because uh, optic nerve sheath meningioma, I do only the decompression. Uh, sometimes in the plane, I can find out the good plane to the optic sheath and the tumor. So in case I eager to remove all the tumor, but I know it's a uh, natural entity or of, of optic nerve sheath meningioma is very close to the optic nerve itself. So it's safer to uh, do the uh, partial removal and do the uh, stereotactic radiotherapy after surgery. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with uh, Professor Stumaker's um, comments. Um, but just to share a little bit um, from experience as well, um, uh, again, I don't have a, a lot of um, experience in optic nerve uh, sheath meningiomas. Um, a lot of them we won't operate, uh, we just uh, proceed go ahead with uh, radiation therapy. But uh, I do have a couple of cases uh, with the transcranial approach uh, using um, um, anterior clonidectomy and then optic sheath and optic nerve decompression and with a partial removal of the tumor, just like uh, Professor Suniga's um, uh, work. Um, uh, indeed, has some of them have some improvements. Um, in the recent cases, I also use the ICT, uh, which I find very uh, useful. Um, one of the reasons, I, in my opinion, uh, of, of, of the uh, visual function deterioration after uh, optic sheath meningioma operation is because of the vasculature of the optic nerve being compromised after or during surgery because um, coagulation may be used. So if we use ICG, uh, in my opinion, um, the uh, vasculature of the optic nerve can be visualized and therefore we may be able to achieve a more uh, precise um, uh, extent of uh, decompression um, versus uh, uh, preservation of the uh, visual function. So um, yeah, so um, uh, the the second question actually is, um, is also from the same um, audience is um, do you operate on all cases of a pseudo tumors? Yeah, uh, if I think this is uh, the possibility of the lymphoma or other malignant entity, I do the biopsy uh, like the uh, lateral approach using the cranial method or the like this. Uh, anterior approach like uh, with the ophthalmologist. Sometimes I do the surgery to the pseudo tumor uh, because if the diagnosis was made, it's good candidate for the steroid and uh, uh, it's good to improve the symptoms. Is that okay? So, um, yes, so uh, the histology is uh, important. I think in terms of I agree. Yes. So, um, if, if I yeah, may ask yeah. one question, yeah. yes, yeah. Sure, Roger. <laughs> yeah, Dr. June, it was wonderful. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I'd like to ask do you use steroids in all post operative cases to the, mitigate the effect of surgery and recovery, enhance the recovery of optic nerve? Do you use steroids? Uh, yeah, if the patient uh, complains that. Uh, uh, yeah, visual uh, deterioration, I use a steroid. And especially in the pseudo tumor or uh, even in the uh, indolent lymphoma cases, I use a steroid like pulse uh, administration. 
Uh, sometimes the patient's visual function is will recover, but otherwise I don't use any steroid. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Calvin? Do you use steroids after your transorbital surgeries? Um, well, um, I don't uh, use the steroids uh, routinely unless uh, there is a deterioration um, of the vision uh, immediately post-operatively. Then um, I use a steroid, um, dexamethasone usually uh, for a couple of days and then tilt it down. Um, or sometimes with uh, some orbital apex syndrome after surgery uh, with transient um, third nerve uh, palsy, then I might consider using a short course of steroids, well, but um, otherwise I don't routinely use it. I would say around maybe five to ten percent of my case of my endoscopic transorbital cases um, that I might use the steroids. Okay, thank you very much, my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Any questions from your side? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, uh, Professor Jun, for a very nice uh, uh, talk. I uh, have two questions, Professor. Uh, how you determine that, uh, especially just a purely uh, corner tumor, how you determine uh, which one is belong to oculoplasty team and which one is belong to neurosurgeon, or you always uh, uh, did your case together? Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, for the closure of the periorbita, uh, how do you deal with the, the periorbita fat that coming out? How do you, you put, put, put them back in, or you going to partially remove it for the closure? Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, sorry, first question is uh, uh, how can I determine the location to the uh, apex area? Uh, no, uh, I mean uh, all the corner tumor. Uh, uh -huh. Do you do it alone uh, or which cases belong to the oculoplasty team or you always combine with the oculoplasty team? So, sorry, I don't know. That. Okay. Professor, Professor Liu uh, means um, uh, how do you, for, for the orbital tumor cases, um, they may be handled by ophthalmologists, eye doctors. Uh, somebody refers to neurosurgeons. So do you always involve the eye doctors or, um, uh, uh. Um, uh, or some of them you just refer to um, eye doctors to perform the surgery? Yeah, uh, recently I do the surgery only, only me, only neurosurgeon. Uh, because the su surgery uh, day is different from the ophthalmologist and me. And uh, former, I asked them to uh, the secure the uh, uh, extraocular muscles from uh, ophthalmologist. And uh, yeah, in the future plan, I hope I think it's very important to uh, cooperate with ophthalmologists because they have much experience and uh, like this trans orbital approaches, I think it's essential, but I don't have any good cooperation with ophthalmologists. So nowadays I do, uh, even though the, all the uh, orbital evacuation by me, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, and what's the second question? Please? The, the close, closing the periorbital uh, uh, with the fat coming out, so how do you deal with it? Do you take away some of the periorbital fat for the closure or how you push them uh, back yeah. in for the closure? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for your good question. And uh, fat itself is, I think, uh, like this huge, after uh, evacuation with a huge tumor, some patients uh, worried about there is uh, like uh, enopsalmos uh, might occur, but never happened to this uh, like uh, surgery because I preserve all the bony structure uh, using uh, the cutting method. Don't remove all the superior root. In case I just uh, suture several stitches, I think it's enough, especially in the uh, feasible and uh, very fragile uh, periorbital cases, I cannot uh, uh, suture. In case I just uh, place the like uh, artificial dura duragen, duragen or just uh, glue, I think it's enough. Uh, in case I I never experienced any enopsalmos. But uh, important thing is uh, <coughs> spheno-orbital meningioma cases, like lateral wall. Uh, it's very important not to remove all the lateral bone. It's easy to uh, make uh, enopsalmos. Thank, thank you, Professor. 
yeah thank you very much we had a very interesting session and we'll move on to the second session but before that we'll hear the concluding remarks from our chair dr calvin mack yes sir. thank you roger so thank you uh, professor Sunika, for the wonderful talk and um, your experience to the uh, vast um, variety of the lesions including um, vascular and vascular uh, tumors, tumors are fascinating. It's a large series. So congratulations on your uh, great work. Um, uh, well, I myself is a I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon and I work um, quite closely with the optoplastic surgeons as well, um, especially for endoscopic plus orbital surgery. Um, uh, to take this series, I, would, I have um, over 30 cases. So um, actually, I would um, recommend um, uh, you to find a good uh, ophthalmologist uh, friend or partner. And then um, probably uh, it's a good start uh, to, um, uh, to start the surgery of uh, endoscopic transorbital surgery, given uh, that you have excellent uh, surgery skills. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, and now we'll hear the second lecture from our honored guest from China. Professor Chen Hua. Professor Chen Hua, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening, everyone. The historical roles of embolization in the treatment of AVM. Embolization is as an adjunct to surgery or radio surgery. Occasionally, embolization may be a curative standalone treatment for the complete occlusion of simple AVM. The advent of the liquid embolization, AVOH, and the development of a detachable tip microcaster have expanded the use of embolization. Revolution of embolization in AVM. Transvenous embolization of AVM has greatly improved the cure rate of the AVM to 96%. This report comes from the Rhenish Paul from German. Lower complication rate in transvenous embolization. And there was no recurrence during the follow up. The indication of transvenous embolization the first is a no suitable artery access. The second is a passing feeling artery in the functional area. The last one is a draining vein can be assessed. But the venous assess is very difficult than arteries assess. Difficult rotation guiding caster during the torturous jugular bump and sigmoid sinus. Difficult to navigate the guiding caster due to the scepter in venous sinus. Difficult to understand the exact anatomy of the drainage Draining vein joining the sinus due to the high flow in sinus. And difficult to assess context wind due to the acute angle of draining vein sinus junction. And the stenosis at the draining vein sinus junction. Difficult to navigate of microcaster due to lack of support in large tortures draining vein. We use the Jungler venous approach in all cases, compared with femoral vein. Jungler vein assess have many advantage. The first is a shorter assess. The second is a stronger support of guiding caster. The last one is a shorter microcaster in enduring in blood vessel. We always use six French trapron with five French in the caster from microvention and the diagnostic caster, five French, 125 centimeter, vertebral curve from merit. And we also use pigtail diagnostic caster from APT Medical. Sometimes we also use long sheet and the intermediate caster. In order to cross the acute angle of draining vein, six French trapron shaped by heating gun. 
and also the 125 diagnostic caster was shaped by 130 degree. This is a pigtail diagnostic caster, was easy to shape. We put the guiding caster in the transvenous sinus. When we look, rotate the guiding caster, the guiding caster was twist. So the diagnostic caster was the uh, uh, best choice was five French, 125 centimeter vertebral curves from Merritt. This is a 125 centimeter diagnostic caster from Merritt. This diagnostic caster cannot be kink. It was braided. So this guiding caster have the good rotation. So when we rotate in the sinus, it will be very easy. Microcaster, we always use flow, flow director caster, marathon. And we also use detachable tape caster, Apollo and Sonic. Then we use the coiling caster, Ancient 10 in Venus. The most, post, the most point in is the largest, large human microcaster, Hathaway 27 and Riba 27. We always use uh, micro guide, guide, micro guiding wire was the Traxxas 14, Synchro 10, Hybrid 07. And the most important here is the 10 exchange guiding wire. For example, Chikai 10 exchange guiding wire from Japan. Sometimes the Apollo cannot follow the guiding wire in torturous winners. So we needed to shape the Apollo microcaster for double curve using steam. And the increasing difficulty in Venus assess. The first uh, was uh, street sinus. The second was uh, superior petrol sinus. And the three was uh, superior sagittal sinus. And the columnar sinus, transverse sinus, and the occluded sinus. The last one was venous anastomosis. The first, first case was embolization of post third ventricle AVM trans cerebral fox sinus. The patient suffering headache. CT scan indicated subarachnoid hemorrhage. DSA indicated post-media carotid artery aneurysm and post-third ventricle AVM. First stage, we call in the aneurysm. We can see the aneurysm come from the P2. This is a First case, first stage, we call in the aneurysm. Second stage, three, 3D DSA indicate torturous feeding artery in the right PCA. The feeding artery is very torturous and very distal to feed in the AVM. This is a feeding artery in the left PCA. 
in the VKC, the training wind was not a strained sinus. Here is the strained sinus. This is the training sinus. We can see two primary wind. This is an AP view in the right ICA. Natural view of the right ICA. This is the left ICA AP view. and the right view of the right left ICA. Chaperone in the guide caster was navigated in the sinus by 35 guide wire. And the micro guide wire navigated in draining wind and exchange in the guide caster. Then we put the six French guiding caster into the sinus. Apollo and Echelon 10 were put in the primary wing. This is a Apollo microcaster. We put the microcaster in the right PCA feeding artery and the left the PCA artery, feeding artery. Pressure cook technique was used both in artery and venous side. The AVM was cured. Second case was embolization of cerebral AVM trans superior petrol sinus, superior petrol sinus. This is not a rupture AVM in cerebral. The guiding caster was put in the sigmoid sinus. But the uh, microcaster echelon 10 was put in the superior petrol sinus and then navigate into the petrol venous. But the microcaster have enough support of the guiding caster to navigate is very difficult. This is the ancient 10 tip. Then we navigate the micro caster into the feeding artery from the pica. This is the micro injection. The flow direct caster cannot put in the supra petrol sinus. We use the coronal guide wire to put the echelon 10 to the primary wing. Then we use echelon 10 to inject onyx from the venous side. First, uh, the onyx was ritual. When the onyx is accrued to the winners, training winners, and then the onyx can penetration into the AVM very quickly.
when the onyx is retrieved. We stop injection. DSA indicated that AVM was cured, but some normal win was accrued. After operation, the MR indicated a little edema, but the patient have no symptom. This is not a ruptured AVM in cerebral. When we when we put the shaped diagnostic caster in superior petrol sinus. The micro caster has strong support. Under the support of a guide caster, micro caster can be navigated into primary when very easy. Guiding caster was in the super petrol sinus and navigated into the petrol wing. And go to the primary wing. So we suggest uh, in every case, we needed to put the guiding caster into the um, primary sex sinus. The next case was embolization of parietal occipital AVM trans superior sagittal sinus. We always know the draining vein sinus junction always acute angle in suprasagittal sinus. It's very difficult to navigate into this context wind. This is a lateral view. The, the feeding artery is very small. So we can't cure this AVM by artery approach. We put two chaperon guiding caster in superior sagittal sinus. The micro caster is difficult to assess the acute angle of the draining vein. So we use the balloon assisted navigation of a micro caster. Under the balloon support, the micro caster assessed to the draining vein. And we use the J-shaped guiding wire to put the micro caster into the primary vein. This is the echelon 10. Then we use the Venus roadmap and use the balloon assist. We put the second Apollo microcaster into the journey way. Using the pressure cooker technique in the Venus, we inject the onyx from the Apollo caster, and we can see the onyx can penetrate to the AVM very well. When the AVM was complete accrued, we retrieve the detached caster. DSA indicate the AVM was cured.
This is unruptured temporal AVM. In this case, draining vein was very torturous. So you can see that this is a draining vein, very, very torturous and have so many curves and bifurcation. We used the shaped pigtail diagnostic caster in this case. The shaped pigtail diagnostic caster was navigated into the cortex draining vein. Under strong, stronger support, the microcaster was navigated into the primary vein very easy. We always use J-shaped guide wire in venous. And sometimes we use the 45 degree guide guide wire to assess the venous bifurcation. This is a bifurcation in the venous. We use the synchro 10. And when the microcaster through the bifurcation, we use the J-shape guide wire. And the microcaster can follow the Micro guide wire. When we face the bifurcation, we use the 45 degree guide wire to through the bifurcation of the venous. If there is no bifurcation in the venous, we use the J shape. You can see the pig tail. Diagnostic caster is very stable. And the Apollo microcaster can follow the J shape guide wire to the primary vein. The DSA indicate the AVM was cured by the artery and the venous pressure cook technique. Sometimes we may face the scepter of the sinus. This case in, was navigation of guiding caster in scepter of the superior sagittal sinus. This is frontal AVM, unwrapped AVM. The feeding artery come from left A1 and A2. The draining vein was, was the vein of Trollard and the labe, labe vein. Labe when sinus junction was very stenosis, we chose the uh, superior sagittal sinus. This is a scepter in superior sagittal sinus. And the cortex draining when sinus junction was acute angle and stenosis. We used J-shaped chaperone in the caster, assessed cortex draining vein. We used the certified guide wire to put the inner caster into the context vein. Under the guiding caster support, the Apollo was navigated 
into the primary vein under the guiding cast support. The Apollo microcast gives sec second micro navigation caster. We withdraw the first guiding caster, guiding caster into the context wind, but it was filled. So this patient, we only use one Apollo caster to embrace the AVM. But I think this is very dangerous without using the press cooker technique in the Venus. So how to solve this problem? We use the double exchange guiding, guiding wire technique. I think this is very, very important technique for Venus embryization. Let me see how to use this technique. This unwrapped AVM was located in the functional area. This is a natural view of the right ICA. This is a 3D rotation. There are three feeding artery of the AVM. This feeding artery may feed in the normal brain. You can see. So we put three microcaster in every feeding artery. And the context draining when sinus junction was acute angle and stenosis. It's very difficult to assess. Very, very difficult. The guiding caster cannot be assessed uh, context draining when because of a stenosis. And we use shaped ancient 10 to get in the draining when this is a guiding wire into the context wind. But the guiding wire cannot through the bifurcation. So we put the microcaster distal and then we use J-shape guide wire to through the bifurcation. Then we exchange 32, uh, 20, 27 micro caster. And then we put the second 10 exchange wire, exchange, withdraw the 22 caster. Then we follow two exchange guide wire to put the two micro caster in the journey way. And then we use the virtual pressure cooker in the draining way. So use the double exchange guiding wire cast technique. When one micro cast get in the vein and we, we can very easy to put the second micro cast. The DSA indicate the AVM was cured. So this Double exchange micro guide wire technique is very, very important in our center. The next uh, area was the current sinus. This case was embolization of brain stand AVM, trans IPS, CS, and bridging vein. 
This is a female, 71 years old patient. He's suffering headache two hours. CT scan indicates subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the DSA indicate perforated aneurysm and the brainstem AVM. This is the DSA before the operation. The surgical plan first stage was calling the perforated aneurysm. Second stage, we embolization of brainstem AVM transvenous. This is the AP view of the left. This is a 3D rotation. We use the microcaster injection. First stage, we call in the aneurysm. One month later, we embolize embolization the AVM through the Venus. We put the guiding caster into the IPS and the four French diagnostic caster was in the IPS. We, we put the coil to support the micro caster to through the bridging vein. But the Apollo cannot navigate distal into the primary vein of the brain stem. This is the micro cast inject in the artery and the vein. So we inject onyx using the Apollo from the venous. And the venous, we check, we wait a moment, and then the onyx penetrate into the AVM. We use the microcaster in artery to inject. And there is no AVM. So we stopped to inject from the venous. The DSA indicate the AVM was cured and we detached Apollo. The most difficult was the transfer transverse sinus. The cause was we can't uh, know the exact anatomy of the uh, transverse sinus and the genuine anatomy. So we used the super select feeding artery and the draining sinus 3D angiography to understand the anatomy. This is a AVM, ruptured AVM in cerebral. And the draining vein was a little small. We cannot exactly understand the, the vein connect to the sinus. So we cannot put the microcaster into the draining vein because the draining vein floor is very low. This is in the occipital sinus. So we use the super selector artery inject 
and uh, the sinus inject at the same time. So we can understand uh, the drainage. Drainage when connect to the sinus. There is very small and stenosis. So if we understand the anatomy, we can get into the draining way. The next case, embolization of temporal occipital AVM, trans, trans, transverse sinus and the larvae vein. This is a white ICA AP view. Lateral view. The AVM, the draining vein was a larvae connect to the sigmoid sinus. There were always stenosis in the draining vein and the sinus junction. We used the merit diagnostic caster to get into the sinus and put the micro caster into the draining vein, use the J shape Got a wire to put the action tank into the draining vein and exchange 22 guide wire. It's Reba 20, uh, Reba 27. And then we put two exchange guide wire through the Reba 27 and then withdraw the Reba 22 microcaster. Then we put two microcaster, follow the two exchange guide wire. We use a pressure cooker in artery and vein sinus. The DSA indicates the AVM was cured. So we can see the double exchange guide wire is very, very important in the venous approach. The next case was embolization of temporal occipital AVM, trans, transverse sinus septum and uh, labae vein. This case is very, very difficult. This is a AP view of the left uh, ICA. We can see the AVM have a lot of draining vein. The largest vein, draining vein was the labae vein. This is a ECA. We can see the MMA and the occipital artery feeding the AVM. First, uh, we put the guiding cast uh, to the contralateral transverse sinus, but we can't get into the labae vein. So we use the double 3D, and we can see there are septum in the transverse sinus. And also we put the guiding caster in the left transverse sinus. We put the guiding wire through the first stenosis and the guiding and the micro guide wire get into the contralateral guiding caster. And then we put the action 10 following the guiding caster from the contralateral side. When the guiding, within the micro caster through the first stenosis, and then we put the guide wire through the second stenosis to get into the draining vein. And then we put the ancient 10 into the draining vein, exchange the balloon to dilute the stenosis at the junction. Then we use the double exchange guiding wire, put two microcaster into the draining vein, and we use the fresh cooker in artery and the venous side. 
then the AVM was cured. We can see the onyx type was penetrated everywhere of the AVM and the drain vein. The last uh, case was embolization of the embryo AVM trans, transverse sinus and the context wing. This is the ruptured uh, AVM in the temporal row. The AVM is very small. This is a white ICA AP view. This is a rotation of the right ICA. We can see the AVM is very small and the draining vein flow is very low. We cannot understand the draining vein connect to the sinus because the flow is very low in the draining vein. So we put the microcaster into the feeding artery and they use the super select injection in the artery and the sinus. Use this technique. We can understand the draining vein connect with the sinus. So we use the Merit diagnostic guiding caster shaped get into the training way and sinus connection and put the first guide wire into the training way. Then we exchange the 32, uh, 27. Weber 27 and use double exchange wire. Then we put the two microcaster into the draining vein, primary draining vein. Calling the draining vein using the ritual pressure cooker technique. And the AVM was cured. This is a lateral view post operation. Oh, sorry, this is the last uh, cases, case. Embryization of occipital AVM trans transverse sinus using looping technique. This was the ruptured occipital AVM. This is a vertebral artery, lateral view. Three D rotation. This is the right ICA AP view. Right to view of the right ICA. But the AVM was small and we cannot understand the draining vein connect to the transverse sinus from the artery. So we put two microcaster into the feeding artery. So, and then we put the uh, guiding caster in the sinus and use the super select artery injection and the sinus injection. We can understand the draining vein connect to the sinus. In this draining vein connect to the sinus, it have the a loop. 
So it's very difficult to navigate the microcaster into the genuine. This is a work projection position. But the guide wire was easy to, to get into the normal wind. When we use the pigtail shaped uh, H10, we get into the training wind. But when we use the micro guide wire, the shape the H10 cannot navigate distal. So we use the exchange guide wire to put the malaton into the sinus scepter and then use the looping technique to put the genuine into the primary genuine. And then we use the pressure cook technique in artery. First, uh, we inject the onyx from the artery. And uh, we can see there are also AVM. So we inject onyx from the draining vein. You can see from the draining vein, the onyx can very well penetrate the whole AVM. And the could the both vein, both draining vein. When the onyx occurred, the, the whole genuine and the AVM, we stop inject. The DSA indicate the AVM was cured. So this is a conclusion. Transvenous embolization is a major evolution in treatment of AVM. The obstacle of venous access was cleared by innovative venous technique system. Most AVM can be cured by embolization com com combining venous and artery approach. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chen Hua. It was a wonderful lecture. Just one question, like what is the uh, recanalization rates in long term follow up in these patients? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, most of the case was uh, this patient, most of the case was uh, uh, in the two years. So, uh, most uh, patients have the short follow up. In the short follow up, we can we cannot see the AVM was recurrence. So when we use the combining embolization from the artery and the venous, the AVM was a real cured and the AVM cannot be uh, recurrence. Right, thank you very much. We have Dr. Jun Sunega still here with us. Yeah. Uh... Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, what kind of uh, onyx do you use? 18 or 34? 18. 18, oh, okay. But, and, um, uh, I think, but I think the onyx 18 uh, is not uh, enough. We need to use the onyx 12. Oh, really? And but, the question... but the onyx 12, uh, we can we cannot have onyx to wear. So we needed to dilute the onyx use the DMSO. Okay. Uh, uh, I have one question, uh, another one question. Uh, do you think that with this pressure cooker technique and the transvenous approach, all the ABMs is cured by safely? I mean, the, there is a possible hemorrhage risk. 
but do you, how do you think about the hemorrhage risk? This is a very good question. Uh, if you imply using the venous approach, you need to cure the AVM complete. If the you if you if if the, the onyx cannot penetrate the all the feeding artery post the operation, it will be hemorrhage. So in in my case, we have thirty two cases. In this thirty uh, in this thirty two case, we have two hemorrhage patients wow. in the in the earlier in the earlier period, but. Uh, in this two year, we have no hemorrhage cases. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank, Mike, you. thank you very much. It is an amazing achievement with the result that you have got. Congratulations. So I'll just wind this up officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Dr. Jun Chunega and Dr. Chen Hua who have given us a wonderful lectures and taught us a special thanks to my co-host Liu Boon Sen and also our chair, Dr. Calvin Mank. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. So until we all meet tomorrow online, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.